Today's daily debrief focuses on two sides of the political coin in the United States. On the one hand, we have the right-wing Republican Donald Trump, who's facing a host of legal challenges due to his support and role in the storming of the Capitol into January 2021. On the other hand, we have Joe Biden, who's extremely unpopular due to his failures to deliver on his promises and equally importantly, for backing to the hilt Israel's genocidal attack on Gaza. In today's episode, we see what lies ahead for the both of them. We begin with Trump, who was disqualified from standing for the primaries in the state of Maine. This is based on a constitutional clause which bans from office those who have indulged in insurrection. The decision by Maine's Secretary of State comes shortly after a Colorado court issued a similar ruling. Cases on the same lines have been filed in other states as well, setting the stage probably for a Supreme Court intervention. We go to Anish for the details. Anish, thanks for joining us. So Maine, the second state to come up with a similar uh, prescription, if we can call it, but a very different one from Colorado. So could you maybe first take us through what the decision by uh, from the state is, what are the terms by, or what are the conditions or what are the reasons mentioned? Well, uh, the reason is quite simple. It's uh, the insurrection lawsuit that has been, it is one of the three lawsuits that uh, that has been fielded uh, with the Secretary of State. Now, in unlike you know most other places, the Secretary of State is essentially the one who handles a lot of domestic matters that includes election uh, qualification and even at, at times uh, the primaries, which are like internal elections for political parties. So, what the State Secretary uh, of uh, the main state uh, had ruled is that uh, Trump is guilty of. Uh, insurrection uh, because of the January 6th capital uh, violence and uh, because of that he is uh, disqualified from standing in the ballot for uh, Republican Party minor primaries. Now the issue, uh, the thing is uh, this is not necessarily a court judgment and uh, it will definitely be appealed uh, over time. Uh, we need to wait and see if it can be done because Maine is one of the first states that go into uh, the whole primary season uh, in the United States. And very often uh, it is one of those states, about, uh, along with New Hampshire, uh, which is seen as, you know, uh, which gives the, uh, the uh, you know, the first lead uh, for most candidates if they actually can make a significant impact in these electorates. Uh, of their parties, uh, they can definitely see, uh, they can keep up the momentum for the rest of the primary season, which goes on for months. Now, uh, so if they do not do it uh, within a week, I think, uh, in less than a week, actually, uh, and if there is no appeal uh, happening at that point, uh, then, pro you know, Trump will not be standing in the primaries in May. And that is going to be a big issue because... Obviously, it's not uh, the number of representatives that it sends, delegates that it sends the Republican Party in Maine uh, from uh, is not that many. Uh, so he can probably turn it around later, but definitely it is going to have a significant impact. And, you know, it will be a major roadblock uh, in the Trump's uh, presidential bid. Uh, on the other hand, we still have 13 more states uh, where the cases are pending. Some of them actually do have uh, you know, uh, Democratic uh, administrations and also uh, state secretaries, uh, even Democratic appointed uh, state Supreme Courts. And uh, in all of them, uh, it is quite, in some of them, it's quite likely that uh, they will follow the same decision. So we need to wait and see how things are going to unfold. On the other hand, the Colorado decision, which is again uh, done by the Secretary of State, uh, pretty much uh, is based on the fact that there is an appeals process happening, so we cannot implement the judgment by the Colorado State Supreme Court, which might seem uh, odd for those of us outside of the United States, because usually you have to get a stay or you know a hold on the judgment, uh, and nothing of that sort has happened yet. But um, the fact that it went to the Supreme Court and is being challenged in the Supreme Court is being used by, again, a Republican uh, Secretary of State to uh, to just uh, hold the decision and keep Trump on the uh, primary ballot. So that clearly shows there is, uh, there is a significant, uh, there is a very clear political divide when it comes to whether or not 
uh, or what shape this uh, these lawsuits are going to take in the coming weeks, even days now, because uh, the primary uh, ballots have to be ready by you know the first week of January in many states. So we need to wait and see how that's going to shape up. Right, Anish, it looks like a lot of this will boil down to what the Supreme Court of the United States decides and there it does seem like the Republicans have an advantage. The Republicans do have an advantage. Uh, they probably will. Uh, it's quite likely that they will uh, win the Colorado appeal before uh, January 5th, obviously. Or, uh, But the question is whether or not the Supreme Court is going to intervene and have like a broader judgment or a broader ruling uh, on the matter uh, you know, take up all those 13 pending lawsuits, uh, you know, uh, and actually give a, de a definitive verdict on the matter of whether or not Trump was guilty of uh, the January 6th uh, and, uh, and by default uh, guilty of insurrection, which is the only thing that disqualifies a person from running for uh, the presidency. Now, uh, the, that, is, that is the biggest question because, A, they might, if it goes to trial, it becomes a federal trial. That is going to have a very different impact and, uh, and very significantly different kind of scrutiny than, say, a state secretary or you know, a state Supreme Court deciding matters. And that is something that the Supreme Court may want to avoid, uh, even though it, is, it has a conservative supermajority. On the other hand, uh, they could just, uh, you know, go through these cases as they come and just, you know, give individual rulings of whether or not they're valid. Uh, and because we are also dealing with uh, primaries and we haven't yet uh, dealt with nominations for the actual federal election, uh, that this is different because in some states, including some democratic states, uh, the administration or the state Supreme Courts have uh, refused to intervene because it is a matter of internal party democracy. And so they did not want to intervene on the matter, uh, whether or not they think Trump was guilty of insurrection. So if uh, the, even if you know Trump kind of uh, swims through this whole primary season without a disqualification, or at least without a major disqualification, uh, there is there are still uh, you know a possibility that uh, Democrats or civil society groups would uh, go after him before the nominations for the federal election happens. So it is still a long way. We are looking at a very long run uh, election season next year, and uh, that it it uh, it is going to be quite interesting. But again, as I said, it is going to be very long drawn and pretty much unlike any of the previous elections uh, we have covered or, uh, you know, we have seen in recent memory. Thanks so much, Anish, for talking to us. Moving on to President Joe Biden, whose full-throated support for Israel has earned him the moniker Genocide Joe. Now, Biden is facing countrywide protests by hundreds of thousands who are in solidarity with the people of Palestine. Equally worrying for Biden ahead of the 2024 elections is dissatisfaction over many unfulfilled promises. Anish is back with us for more on this. Anish, welcome back. We are now talking about Biden after talking about Trump. Uh, first of all, of course, I want to ask you a bit about the, city, uh, the response to Biden's policies in Palestine. We have seen hundreds of thousands taking to the streets. You know, a very uh, number of polls saying that there is a great amount of support for a ceasefire, a lot of disapproval of how the U.S. administration is handling the situation. Could you take us through what's happening there? Well, uh, what we're looking at is uh, how, the, for, for a very long time in the United States, there was always this uh, sort of smokescreen uh, when it came to Israel. And it was pretty much successful. The propaganda machinery that existed, that supported uh, Israel's wars, we, uh, we are not talking about one or two. It's like there, were, there have been multiple wars on uh, Palestine. And uh, there was only uh, a minority, even if though they were like prominent and like they were visible uh, in several places, it was only a minority opinion to actually support self-determination of Palestine in the mainstream uh, you know, public opinion in many cases. But right now what we're seeing is uh, there is complete, uh, you know, uh, overwhelming support for Palestine this time around. Uh, even uh, the spin doctors who try to make, uh, turn it into like Palestine uh, or Palestinian resistance uh, had uh, provoked the whole uh, situation it does not work anymore because of the kind of reports obviously that are reaching there. And despite how, and we have seen that uh, in multiple times, uh, in the mainstream media, despite how the headlines are, uh, you know, uh, tinkered a bit to make it seem as if somehow 
the 21,000 people who died in Gaza just died off their own and not because of a very targeted genocide that is being conducted in uh, Gaza. And uh, this is something that the Democrats, the establishment Democrats have not uh, reckoned with yet, because obviously they continue to be beholden by, uh, you know, basically they're beholden by lobbyist money in most cases. And considering the fact that uh, the Zionists are the biggest lobbying group, IPAC in fact, are the biggest lobbying group when it comes to foreign policy issues, uh, it is uh, no surprise, and much of their money also goes to the Democrats for uh, that matter. It, it is no surprise that there is, uh, you know, this complete disconnect from the people's opinions, and uh, this is something that uh, that's something that is definitely coming to bite them. Uh, and it is it, it is not definitely looking good. It has actually brought down uh, Biden's approval ratings even further than what it should have been. Uh, I mean, considering the mismanagement, but it's it's just dented uh, the entire image that Biden is somehow significant when it comes to shaping or directing foreign policy issues in the country. Right, Anish, but to go back to some more domestic issues now, uh, Biden coming in promising to reverse a lot of policies of the Donald Trump administration, making a lot of promises to key sections of his voter base. How successful has he been in sort of fulfilling these promises or delivering on them? Uh, well, the I mean, if you're talking about success, there has to be some intent to actually achieve some of that success. And what the Biden administration has uh, displayed is that there has been no intent whatsoever to deliver on any of these promises. Uh, very often, technicalities have been used as a defense uh, against criticism. Uh, very often, uh, you know, the, the fact that they do not have an overwhelming majority in the Senate has been used for the last, uh, the first two years more uh, of their administration uh, as a defense, uh, uh, you know, or as a very convenient excuse uh, to actually say that, oh, but because we do not, we can't stop the filibuster, we can't do anything about it. But we forget the fact that the filibuster is something that they could have done something about as well before the Congress convened at the start of Biden's administration. So the fact that the establishment Democrats want to continue to keep this very convenient uh, excuse in place so that they can be uh, stonewalled, any kind of progressive legislation can be stonewalled, is, uh, shows that there, is, there has been very complete lack of intent on their part. Uh, this comes uh, on major policy issues, including uh, you know, healthcare, uh, expansion of Medicaid or uh, different kinds of healthcare programs that the government has, uh, expanding the COVID era uh, welfare policies uh, that actually afforded a lot of people a saving grace in many ways uh, to actually uh, get out of poverty, even if it was for a very brief moment. And even if it was far shorter than what they were uh, required, it actually did help a lot of people. He cut down on those. He pretty much abandoned the entire, uh, you know, fifteen dollar uh, per hour uh, minimum wage. Uh, that was pretty much one of his, uh, you know, campaign plank, and all of that was completely. And and you see, like all of these factors, once they fail, they just get abandoned unless there is a massive movement or backlash, uh, that, backlash so huge that they cannot really just sit tight and like ignore. So it, it is some, somewhat of that sort that we are seeing uh, the establishment Democrats, actually the Democratic Party overall, we can't really differentiate at this point who is the establishment and who is not, is the progressive. But the Democratic Party as a whole, more or less, have pretty much abandoned a lot of their policies. And that is, uh, you know, that's showing, and this is despite many of the policies, the campaign promises that they have shown are wildly popular in the United States. And that has, uh, we saw with the referendum on abortion in a very uh, considered strongly conservative voting state uh, in pre uh, previously. And all of that uh, is somehow completely missed. Uh, the messaging uh, from the people have been completely missed by the Democrats and especially the Biden administration. And that pretty much is showing in the manner in which he is losing support. Uh, and if he has to completely, he has to stand against Trump, there is a good chance that he might not see a second term uh, in, you know, the next, uh, next year in the, uh, the general elections. Anish, thank you so much for the analysis. That's all we have in this episode of Daily Debrief. We'll be back tomorrow. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and follow us on all the social media platforms.